Good afternoon. I'm here with poet to poet, writer to writer, uh, Doug Holder, and my guest this afternoon is Marcus Breen. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you, Doug. Pleasure to be here. You can hear me okay? I can hear you well. No problem. Good. Now, Marcus was born in Melbourne, Australia, and educated at the University of Queensland. He is currently director of the Media Lab at Boston College. He has a collection of interviews with Boston academics and researchers entitled Boston Media Theory. His books include The Internet, um, um, the, Inter the Internet and Unintentional Consequences, Our Place in Our Music, Aboriginal Music, and others. Uh, he, uh, his latest book is a new one for him. It's poetry, and it's 20 Days by 20, 400 Lines in Australia. Um, so we're going to talk a little, we're going to talk about his book and he'll maybe get a chance to read, um, and, um, some, a bit, some, a, a little bit about your career. Okay. Um, now your new book, uh, 20 days by 20 seems to be a long stream of consciousness, um, starting with, uh, visiting your declining mother, um, while visiting your native Australia. You, did get, you dedicate your book to your mother. Um, tell us a bit, a bit about your relationship. Obviously, it was a close one. Yeah, well, thanks, yeah, it was a close one. And it was also, like many of these things, conflicted. I, I had a very pleasant and uh, somewhat sort of convoluted childhood, having been born in Melbourne then, at the age of six, moving to Brisbane. And then after a few years, the, the seven years moving back to Melbourne uh, with, with my parents increasingly uh, financially struggling. And then after a couple of years in Melbourne, moving back to Brisbane, and that's where I went to the University of Queensland. And this was all motivated by their evangelical Christian faith. So they were determined to do good by by God, if you like, and they dragged their five children along with them. And what this meant is that I uh, had a somewhat conflicted um, sense of loyalty to them and a sense of continual loss as one leaves a place and then grows up leaves, grows up leaves, and sort of gets in this sort of rhythm of, of what is what what is wrong with both my par my parents and also with the world. And I became uh, very disgruntled uh, and unhappy about the fact that my parents were persisting with this God-given responsibility to go and evangelize. And so I, um, I had a fairly difficult relationship with my mother in my early 20s. And my father died when he was 52. So then we moved into all sorts of a new emotional territory. But um, my mother and I had a huge disagreement over my remo removing myself from what she anticipated would be my continuation of her faith. And that then led to a, a massive rupture. And uh, that then had to be repaired. And in that repairing, after many years, uh, we grew quite fond of each other, although, of course, we were on two very different pathways. Hers continued all the way to the pearly gates, as it were, and my con mine continued in a truly secular uh, sense. She was a highly animated, intelligent woman uh, and completely committed to her faith and to her active belief. And she did a lot of good things in her life, but it was a, it was a, a difficult relationship. And but course, it's always the, uh, there's always that yin and yang you know, in a lot of relationships. Mm. Oh, always, I think. And, and you know, in, in terms of family, it's almost impossible to say, well, that's it, I'm leaving. I've never understood it, really. If people have said, well, I, don't, I haven't seen someone for years and they're a blood relative, you know, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father. Uh, I've, I've never uh, been able to comprehend that, uh, even at the deep, deepest and darkest moments of my troubled relationship with my mother, uh, I, I was not in a, in a position to say I would never see her again. And you know, one never says never. And that was a case where I just couldn't do it. Would, you want, your mother, would you want your mother to see this book? Yes, I think she'd be, she, she had enormous uh, intellectual capacity and she was uh, capable of, of managing a lot of stuff, particularly as she got older. 
and we were reconciled and she reconciled to a lot of things and you know, she came from a a sectarian world that is uh, irish protestant and that that meant that she had very clear lines of demarcation from the uh, through her childhood and then into maybe her 70s 60s and 70s and then she had to start re recognizing that the world wasn't just black and white and it was great to see that transition and she was uh, very supportive of me and my work and, and in fact she was very proud of me and told me ask my forgiveness for being so tough on me and very proud of what i achieved so you know can't complain really um, and, you know, it's interesting, uh, her being an event, I mean, the origins of Australia, uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't know how accurate my history is, but a lot of ex-convicts, ne'er-do-wells, uh, were, were imported from the English colonies. I will. Um, and uh, so Australia could be, say, a nation of renegades. Uh, and um, your mother was prim and proper evangelist. Uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, I mean, do you accept your renegade background? Or, uh, was your mother uh, was yeah, apologetic yeah. for it? Uh, yeah, I, 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 well, I certainly accept it. I'm, I'm quite confident, confident, confident and comfortable with, my, with myself. But you do make a good point that there was certainly this idea of evangelizing the, the, the lost and the, and, the, and the hopeless and the, and the pathetic <laughs> people who were non-believers. Non we're in all those categories. It was a real sort of othering, as, as sociologists and psychologists say now. Uh, and she was, you know, she was determined to um, evangelise and, and save them. And she was very much involved in the, what was called the social project of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, she and my father built a home for delinquent girls. And uh, she, she raised enormous amounts of money, built this mass, built a huge block of land in Ivanhoe in Melbourne, built this massive house with all these rooms and then the family so all of us uh, and she and my father moved in and and she would go to the prisons and uh, collect you know prostitutes and drug addicts and homeless women who had nowhere else to live in that, and they live in our home so it was pretty 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 formative i was um from about three till the age of six uh, mm -hmm. that was my that was my home oh interesting so um yeah. What was the, I mean, you, you did a lot of scholarly writing and all that. Uh, what was the impetus for poetry, for writing poetry? Yeah, I mean, you, your new book is a poetry book. Sure, yeah, the, it, started, it started many years ago, really, when I, when I discovered that I really just felt the, the sort of urgency of, and, and the pleasure of writing. And before I was an undergraduate at, at uh, high school, I would write and write simply for myself. And then I would come and go. And, you know, there was usually, was usually no, breaking up here. doing graduate work, doing Bible study, understanding the uh, fundamentalist tradition. Is it's you know it's like a in the Jewish yeshiva. You know, it's uh, you're at church almost every day. And uh, there is no no safe haven for for the disbeliever, you know, as it were, and and so poetry became something of a obviously to the pleasure of writing and to uh, kind of communicate in a way with the emotions that I was trying to uncover and, and work through. I don't want to psychoanalyze it too much, but then I had the pleasure of you know just continuing to fiddle around with poetry when I was at the Australian National University in the early eighties and met a guy called John A. Scott, who was teaching writing in Canberra, which is the national capital. And he put up a meeting somewhere at ANU saying, you know, if you've got poetry, let's meet. And so I thought, oh, I'll go in and have a, meet, have a meeting with this guy. And one other person and I turned up and you know, it was just one of those things. He became something of a mentor for a little while, for a couple of years, and we'd meet and talk about his writing. and. Uh, he'd talk about what I was doing and always showed great interest in it. And so from the early 80s, I, I wrote quite a lot uh, in Canberra and I was involved with the writing scene and with journalism. But did you publish? Also, uh, did you writing. publish? Did you publish books? Uh, poetry books? Uh, not books, no. No, no. no not, not at all, but certainly was involved in uh, with the publishing scene and had a mm -hmm. poem published here and there in the, in what we might think of as uh, and in, uh, and in a fact, kind you of see, alternative you... press scene. Like the small press scene, 
And in fact, you told me that Melbourne had quite a bohemian scene there, right? Absolutely, right? very, very bohemian. Uh, and and you know bohemian and and active and still does uh, particularly in the in the uh, what we call the inner city uh, suburbs or neighbourhoods like Fitzroy Collingwood Carlton uh, North Melbourne uh, always lots of people writing and engaged in in writing uh, in a in a sort of bohemian way it was great now uh, th this short meandering book always has the ghost of death and close proximity. I like to have. Uh, I like how it crops up in the middle of your reflections about your trip home. Uh, this, of course, mimics most of our uh, own stream of consciousness, the disjointed thoughts as we live our lives. Maybe you can comment on that. When when you're moving through history and you have a consciousness of your your history, I suppose you have a consciousness of the finite and the end of time. And there's something very strange about sitting on a plane going from Boston to Los Angeles, or as, as I tend to do Boston to Vancouver, and then fly all the way across the Pacific to Australia. It gives you a lot of time to reflect, to think about what you're gonna meet, who you're gonna meet, and what's gonna be at the other end when you get off the damn thing. You know, I mean, it's 24 hours in the air. That's not all the tra you know, transfers at airports and other things. And there's a long time, sort of 17 and 18 hours from the west coast of the United States to Australia. And it's, it's both exhausting and illuminating. So by the time I got there, not you know, typically exhausted, it's a, a trip I would do probably once every year or once every year and a half on average. By the time I got there this time in uh, uh, last year, I realized it was probably the last time I was going to see my mother and I wanted to th to try and establish a clear path that would then serve as a sort of diary or but also try and navigate it through uh, a formal language and that's how the idea for 20 days 20 lines came up that I thought I would write 20 lines every day which is how I enter, how the book starts about what I'd met. And what I met was of course, the end of life of my mother and then all the other characters that, are, that surround me and uh, en enable me as it were to navigate uh, the fact that this is the last time I'm gonna see someone with whom, as I've already, already noted, had a pretty conflicted relationship for a long time, but who was incredibly uh, loving. Uh, you know, love can be, quite misguided in some in some time in some uh, places and in some relationships and certainly uh, in I, I think it's fair to say in uh, the fundamentalist and protestant relationships uh, love is you know love is very much like both the carrot and the stick and unfortunately it's often more the stick than, than the carrot a, a, a serious form of discipline one, one goes into this uh, sort of conscious experience uh, saying, well, rec recognizing uh, the the sadness of the experience, and then all the other tentacles of emotion that are connected to it through through people and through places that one's familiar with. Okay. Now you fully engage. Poetry the is the best way, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. You fully engage the senses. Um, does that come naturally to you, or is this a difficult for you in your writing? I think it comes pretty naturally to me, and, uh, and it's a product. It's a product of my my childhood and and youth. Uh, there's a point at which one's socialisation can't be avoided. You know, I'm, I'm sat through hundreds of sermons, hundreds of Bible studies, hundreds of moments. Even you know, my father was active in bringing Billy Graham to Australia. Uh, all these uh, evangelical evangelical environments that are are grounded in emotion and the manipulation of emotion. And so that's sort of, not that I'm doing that, but I, it's like a default uh, way of uh, engaging with a kind of rhetorical form of speech. 
that comes naturally to me, and I think it comes naturally to me partly because of the way I was uh, I was raised in this incredibly emotional environment. And having stepped back from it, I realise uh, what what's happening. And I also I like poetry in in this in this pure sense that it's that why I why I do it is to try and find those emotional points of reference that speak not only from something that I am and who I am, but then also connect and speak to the reader. And uh, the, you know, I'm, I've listened to a lot of music. I used to be a music critic and music writer. My sister is a is a composer, and you know, music is very important in our family. So there's also that side of it, Doug. the the idea of of trying to uh, um, arrest the uh, the invisible. And the the emotion, and to bring the emotion to the to the foreground uh, somehow in language. Um, you have written extensively about the internet, and your book, one of your book, explores the unexpected consequences of the internet. What was, I mean, just very briefly, what mm. was the ideal for the internet, and what has it actually become? Oh well, the internet was an ideal source of knowledge for everybody and it was going to be this thing right digital thing uh, that would transmit endless amounts of knowledge from, produced by human beings uh, in a global sense around the world and everybody would have access to it and it'd be fantastic and then it did <laughs> you know it was commercialized capitalism got a bit of a, a, a sort of stranglehold on it and it's become something quite different. It's now a tool for selling things to us, to for a tool for surveilling us, uh, and a tool for uh, helping us organise organise our lives. In fact, it's it's increasingly central for organising our lives. And I'm not sure, you know, the balance between the kind of dependency and even the determinism of the internet on how we get through the day and the way that it offers emancipation by giving us access to all different sorts of knowledge is are the two kind of contradictory aspects of of the thing that we've got now and that's what i try and explore and in that, in that book uprising it's called uprising the internet's unintended consequences what i did was to try and uh, explore what what was not planned from the internet which i think now that we're coming to the end of president trump's presidency i think we can say that what it what it unearthed were all these emotions and and the culture of people who'd not previously before had a voice um you know people who are who are sometimes immiserated or people who are losing their rights and losing their capacity to live well as we see with the um, many of the people who support mr trump and who have a vehicle with which to uh, communicate you know the old nothing much more than this little device and uh, they can communicate with each other and they've created quite some quite some challenges uh, for uh, the the established order of, of uh, us and, and really global socializing together using facebook and twitter and and google so that's um, my theory there so uh why don't you uh read a little uh, a couple of selections from your new book um which can be ordered is it out yet it is out yet, no it's right? not quite it's not quite, not out. quite out, out yeah but it, no. but it but it can be ordered at the wilderness house uh press uh Steve Barnes. so maybe you can read a few poems a couple okay okay well i'll start at the, i'll start at the beginning um and uh, because it describes uh, how it started and I suppose it also takes me back to or takes me to the Irish aspects of, of my identity which is uh, uh, whiskey so they're just numbered the days are numbered 20 days are numbered number one before the second Jamison there was as usual the beginning of an idea to author a poem each day in the country of my birth now, after two Jamison, on day one, I wonder if this can be sustained for 20 more consecutive days with, with worthy competence. Slowly, always after arriving, 
the deep home of me speaks of lengthening recollections, of lessening nostalgic flummery with portions of memory, sliced grey matter. On the television, Ninja Warriors, Australia is ahead of the US and the EU while the whiskey blurs jet lag and friends fail to pick up two days before the Melbourne Film Festival opens. I'll jump ahead a little bit to uh, one, if you like, about my mother. This is just number three. Victorian architecture in gardening offers botanicals of metered flora, like a good nature poem, only better, as we leave on time for lunch with Marianne, recently widowed. If such lines seem banal, then see this reference to the Holocaust. As she whispers the word, my dearest Jewish cousin, escaped cosmopolitanist, yet unsure about Muslim assimilation. As now today, Myrtle, my mother, cannot rise from her bed, body askew, feet on the floor, face in pillow. It's a crazy world, then falling back into the pillow. I stroke her hair, reminding her of how she stroked mine when, as a child with chronic tonsillitis, she'd stroked my hair, rebirthing connections nearly buried. So that's a couple of ext extracts. So thank you uh, for uh, joining us on uh, Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer, um, Marcus. I'm going to 